because I, I mean to talk about an aspect of Catholic culture um, and American culture. And I trust here that at the International Institute for Culture, people understand what Daniel Patrick Moynihan said when he defined the essence of conservatism as this. The central conservative truth is that it is culture, not politics, that determines the success of a society. The central liberal truth is that politics can change a culture and save it from itself. And what we need to do today, of course, is to save our culture from an aggressive political liberalism that is trying to gun down tradition, Christianity, and finally, freedom. A recent example of this comes from, believe it or not, Ireland. Ireland has become the first country in the world to outlaw smoking in all public places, including pubs. In fact, an Irish politician has been arrested for lighting up in a pub. Can you imagine? In Ireland. But Ireland is a fast, de-Catholicizing nation. It wants to be seen as liberating itself from what <coughs> too many of its people consider a stifling Catholic heritage. Stifling because the common view is that the Catholic Church has been an obstacle to Ireland joining the modern world in its prosperity. The Church, these critics say, or assume, is oppressive one of the greatest enemies of freedom in the world and throughout history. An institution in constant need of liberalization, reform, and indeed perhaps even abolition. I'm here to tell you tonight, however, that the Catholic Church is a defender of freedom. In fact, it is the greatest defender of freedom that the world has ever known. So let's get back to smoking. <laughs> Because through its carcinogenic haze, we can distinguish that the Catholic Church and the rest of the world have two radically different ideas of what freedom is. Again, I'll quote my admired English journalist friend, Auburn Waugh. I think he got to the nub of the issue rather well when he envisioned a scene in a tobacconist shop after the British government, I believe on the same day, voted to raise from 16 to 18 the age at which one could legally buy a cigarette and lowered from 18 to 16 the age at which homosexual activity was to be legal. Please, sir, says the lad, might I buy a pack of cigarettes? Well, I know, my son, you're too young, but I can sodomize you if you like. <laughs> this absurdity, my friends, tends to be the modern view, does it not? It is a view that in short takes biblical sins and makes them human rights and makes up its own list of secular sins and prohibits them. The Catholic poet Alexander Pope said that to speak his thought is every free man's right, but not anymore it isn't. As, I, as uh, Dr. Haas said, I work in Washington, D.C., and it, you know that someone's going to be telling you the truth, what they really think in Washington, D.C., if they take you behind closed doors, if they skulk in a corner, if they whisper in your ear. No one is willing to speak openly. And it's not just in Washington. The greatest novelist, living novelist, in the English language, in my opinion, is George MacDonald Fraser. And in his recent oddly titled memoir, The Lights on Its Signpost, he says this of the present generation of his fellow Britons. They regard themselves as a completely <coughs> liberated society, when the fact is that they are less free than any generation before them since the Middle Ages. Indeed, there may never have been such an enslaved generation, enthralled to hang-ups, taboos, restrictions, 
and oppressions unknown to their ancestors. They won't believe, of course, that they don't know what freedom is and that, they were, and that we were freer by far 50 years ago. We could say what we liked. They can't. We were not subject to the aggressive pressures of special interest minority groups. They are. We had no worries about race or sexual orientation. They have. We could and did differ from fashionable opinion with impunity and would have laughed political correctness to scorn. Alas, great writer though he is, Fraser retains the lingering anti-Catholicism of a Scotch Presbyterian childhood, or he might have been kinder to the Middle Ages. But he's right to highlight this liberal paradox, that liberalism enshrines obscenity and pornography and sin as freedom, but denies the freedom that truly matters, freedom of conscience, speech, and thought, freedom really to simply tell the truth. And the ultimate goal of this bigotry, which increasingly carries the force of law, is to abolish the Catholic Church. Because what the Church stands for are many of the secular, or are many of the things that the secular world wants to outlaw. In Canada, we've already seen the courts tell the Church that it cannot officially affirm in its schools that homosexuality is wrong, because homosexuality is a legal right. In my home state of California, the courts have affirmed the government's right to compel Catholic charities to cover contraceptive services in their insurance programs, regardless that the church considers these sinful. Or think more broadly. I'll, I'll say on that point that the one California judge who stood against that ruling was someone I'd worked with in the governor's office, in fact, uh, Janice Rogers Brown who sometimes mentioned as a possible Supreme Court judge. Uh, or think more broadly, though. Think of the continual efforts of some liberal pressure groups to undo the entire history of Jesus and the Christian Church and demand women priests. Now, there are plenty of pro Protestant denominations that now offer female ministers, but to them, that's not the point. Women have a civil right to be priests and no damn church can stand against it. That's the secular liberal version of freedom, banning opposing points of view, and doing so in the name of their so-called freedom, which is really uniformity. That view is da very dangerous, even physically dangerous. If I might beg your patience and cite yet again Auburn Waugh, who's obviously someone I admired a great deal, <laughs> he pointed out that when the Anglican Archbishop of Canterbury decided to ordain women priests. It was an open question whether he had really this authority and this power. Because for 2,000 years, no one had ever thought so. In which case, such power was untested. And it was only prudent, therefore, that he designate an Australian Archbishop to try it out on a kangaroo first. Not only worked on the kangaroo, but then ordained on people and women. Now, the question of whether the Anglican Church should, in fact, ordain kangaroos is one that I, and I'm sure you, have thought much about. But when one reads the words of the Episcopal Bishop of Virginia, my adopted state, the Right Reverend Peter J. Lee, that, quote, if you must make a choice between heresy and schism, always choose heresy, unquote. <laughs> One has to assume that a kangaroo could do no worse. The Right Reverend Bishop goes on to say that, quote, as a heretic, you are only guilty of a wrong opinion. As a schismatic, you have torn and divided the body of Christ. Choose heresy every time. <laughs> End of quote. He was, say the newspaper reports, quoting a Presbyterian in this affirmation of the goodness of heresy vis-a-vis -vis schism. Now I ask you, how does one possibly make sense of this? The assumption is that heresy does no harm to the body of Christ. And we have an Episcopalian in schism from Rome in its billion-strong Catholic Church citing a Presbyterian 
not an Episcopalian, about the necessity of preventing a schism, presumably from the Presbyterian Church, though which Presbyterian Church, there are several, is not stated. In fact, if one were to define Protestantism, one could actually define it as endless schisms in the name of sola fide, or of finding the faith that fits you. You can choose. It's sort of like Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy's opining that, quote, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning of the universe, and of the mystery of life, end quote. Now, Justice Antonin Scalia, who I've actually stood directly behind heading into towards the confessional in Washington, <laughs> has called this the famed sweet mystery of life passage. <laughs> the thing that strikes one about it, as Professor Ralph McInerney has noted, if it is true, it is false. <laughs> if I have such a fundamental right, I can employ it to define Justice Kennedy, his decision, and indeed the Supreme Court out of existence. The Kennedy decision is simply false. It is literal nonsense. Now, much as one might want to define the Supreme Court out of the universe, we can't. There is such a thing as reality. In fact, Dr. Haas was telling me that it was Thomas Aquinas' affirm affirmation that there is such a thing as reality that helped bring him from the Episcopal Church to the Catholic Church. So this is a shocking thing for Protestants. <laughs> <laughs> but there is such a thing as reality. But reality doesn't need much of a check on the triumph of literal nonsense, especially about the idea of freedom outside of the Catholic Church. Wherever one looks in the modern world, one finds massive confusion about the nature of freedom. I recently saw a newspaper notice about a French actress protesting that some ridiculous film in which she had appeared, was going, which featured graphic sexual acts, was going to be censored for an American audience. Americans, she pouted in that cute French way, are afraid of sex. Oh, really? Is that so, mademoiselle? <laughs> now, I know I'm a piker in regard, in this regard, heard to some, especially Dr. Haas, but I'm the father of five children, and I can tell you that any father of five children has every right to be afraid of sex. <laughs> <laughs> but perhaps more to the point, I wonder if mademoiselle l'actrice is so unafraid of sex that she is open to the transmission of life. I wager not. Her countrymen certainly aren't. They are so afraid of sex that they are rapidly depopulating themselves and on the road to becoming a Muslim country as a result. Perhaps even in our children's lifetime, these demographic models can be believed. <coughs> the Western world is so afraid of sex that it has said there is no such thing as male and female. We're all the same in any combination of these genders, and ne never sexes nowadays, genders, in various sorts of vaguely contraceptive or contraceptive activities are not only listed, but human rights, so long as one doesn't smoke afterwards. Catholics say you can smoke if you want to, that's, that's your choice. Liberals say, no, 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 smoking is bad. On the other hand, secular liberals say, you can kill that baby if you want to. That's your choice. Because that baby in your womb is dependent upon you. You have power over it. Remember your self-esteem and assertiveness classes. Use it, kill that baby if it's inconvenient. Catholics say, no, the freedom begins with the right to life, and that freedom cannot be defined as the right to kill those who are dependent on us. Freedom cannot be defined as the abolition of responsibility. And on this point, perhaps, we can move this conversation from the profane to the sacred. Authentic freedom is never freedom from the truth, 
but always freedom in the truth. That's Pope John Paul II speaking. That's what he wrote in his encyclical Veritatis Splendor. Freedom from the truth is the make-believe world of Justice Kennedy, of that French actress, of the irresponsible, and of those who coin non sequiturs like gay marriage and force them into law. Freedom in the truth is the church. It is the church that affirms that marriage is ordered to the procreation and education of offspring, and that defends that freedom of the divine and natural order to fulfill itself, and in doing so defends the most dependent part of that marriage, the children. Let's step back for a moment and distinguish two realms of freedom, because the Catholic Church is attacked on both, the personal and the political. The Catholic Church, we're told over and over again, is a repressive institution that wrongly inhibits harmless and natural desires, inculcates unnecessary guilt, and is hypocritical in any event, full of sodomite priests and doddering bishops and brutal nuns who attempt to force their minions to march in lockstep rote recitation of a rather gruesome and intolerant fairy tale. As one of my sons has taken to saying, in fact, he says this far too often, yeah, right. <laughs> the fact is, as Pope John Paul II has said, this is a quote, Christianity is not an opinion and does not consist of empty words. Christianity is Christ. It is a person. A person, I might add, that we find in history and who tells us that the truth will set us free. The church affirms freedom through the doctrine of free will, a doctrine that puts the church at odds with the world. It is the world that tells us that the fate of nations and individuals is determined by race or by economics or by history, or by psychology, or genetics, or fate, or astrology, or the will of Allah, or even, insofar as Protestants have any doctrinal beliefs left at all, predestination. Anything but the free will decisions of individuals with regard to the truth. The Catholic Church stands alone in radical defense of man's free will and his God-given right to that freedom. When the media and Protestants and dissenters tell practicing Catholics that sexual activity is something that is overwhelmingly powerful and that can't be controlled or renounced, Catholics alone say, no, man is born free. All Christians are called to chastity, and what they are called to do, they can do. And some can freely take on celibacy as a sacrifice to better serve Christ and his church. I have met cloistered nuns in Alabama who are among the happiest people I know. Again, as a father of five, I have come to envy the celibate priesthood. <laughs> and to those of you who are unmarried, I say, get thee to a nunnery or get thee to a seminary before it's too late. When I was choosing a career path, I did not think of the priesthood because I was not yet a Catholic. I myself wised up too late. Now my goal was to join, as a San Diego boy, the Marine Corps. But that got foiled because of some lingering doubts about the severity of my childhood asthma and various bumps and bruises and injuries I collected along the way that, uh, that made me sort of 4F, I suppose. Um, so I've been forced to make my living in the, in the brutal world of profit and loss. I have always found it absurd, though, even the, before I became a full-fledged wage slave with a mortgage, that feminists in the secular world regard caring for children, taking care of a family, and working to create a joyful home as slavery and drudgery and that freedom lies in the Washington, D.C. life of power breakfasts, 
Power lunches and power dinners, pushing papers, making deals, producing and consuming, and going out on the town for sex in the city. How is it that in the modern equation, freedom is getting and spending and power and consumerism as applied to everything? And yet caring for other people and their happiness is slavery. The home is not slavery. The Catholic knows that as Captain Jack Aubrey says in the film Master and Commander of his ship, it is this little world. For the Catholic, home is a sanctuary. Referring to the workaday world as the rat race, that, my friends, is a cliche that is true. There's not much inspiration in that world, at least not for, for me. So I look to soldiers still, even on occasion, cinematic ones, and they provide it. When Maximus, in the movie Gladiator, rallies his cavalrymen with the words, what we do in life echoes in eternity, he is speaking like a Catholic and not like a Protestant or a Muslim who believes that eternity is already written and that man has no free will. In fact, I don't know if you remember the movie, um, I'm a great Anglophile too, but uh, Lawrence of Arabia, where Lawrence is riding off, and Anthony Quinn yells at him, it, it, it is written, you cannot do this, it is written. And Lawrence, Peter O'Toole, shouts back, nothing is written. Anthony Quinn later says, for some men, nothing is written. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I should perhaps add, um, also parenthetically here, that just because I've cited two film roles of Russell Crowe, that does not mean that I consider him our Catholic exemplar. <laughs> I can only say, though, that uh, I remember the story when he was filming the movie Gladiator in Morocco. A, um, an Arab came up protesting and said, he has broken all the commandments of Allah. And someone who has done that can't be all bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I can say that because when it comes to freedom, Catholics are well aware of human nature, of reality. That's why Chesterton wrote, in joy, not in scolding that the rolling English drunkard made the rolling English road. That's why in the films of the Catholic director John Ford, you find joyful fisticuffs. That's why indeed Martin Luther found the Roman church, the whore of Babylon. Because Catholics have never tried to ban human nature. Instead, if we understand authentic freedom as freedom in the truth, we understand that creation is good. The natural law is written on men's hearts. And happy are those who march beneath the sign of the cross. But there is a cross. And our lives are a drama, a lifelong journey of <coughs> sin and redemption. So when skeptics complain that the evidence for God is not clear, or that a God who allows suffering and evil is himself sadistic and evil, the Catholic responds, our God has made us free men. True freedom always comes with costs and challenges. You see, ours is not a religion of make-believe where actions have no consequences. Ours is a religion of pilgrimage freely accepted to grow in Christ. Or to put it another way, the way Pope John Paul II put it in Redemptor Hominis, the church wishes to serve this single end, that each person may be able to find Christ in order that Christ may walk with each person the path of life. And we know that Christ would have no problem bending his elbow at a tavern or walking in step with a centurion. Let's take the entry of that centurion to broaden the discussion to political freedom because it is an oft-propounded myth that the Western world didn't taste of freedom until the revolt of Martin Luther and the Protestant revolt. 
The short answer to this is bollocks, but let's try a longer answer. <laughs> Luther's revolt led to the division of the church. Where it succeeded, it led to the creation of state-sanctioned and state-subordinated churches. Churches, indeed, in many cases, with the Protestant ministers as civil servants. And it eventually led, in some countries, to the separation of church and state, and then finally to the irrelevance of church to state. That was the result of Luther's revolt. It is easy why the secular world would view this as a blow for freedom, because it was a defeat for Christianity. But who would blatantly say that the Renaissance, against which Luther revolted, was not free? Indeed, Luther revolted against it because it was free. He was opposed to the church's sponsorship of classical learning. He thought classical learning a, quote, heathen plague. The Reformation Protestant churches were opposed to art, the religious arts sponsored by the Catholic Church. For this, they warned, was idolatry. The Protestants stood for sola scriptura, the Bible alone, as Christianity's sole authority. They were biblical literalists, fundamentalists. They were, in fact, the Taliban of the Western world smashing altars and crucifixes and stained glass, slapping coats of paint over religious murals, and in Calva's Geneva, certainly, finding, legislating, and enforcing a sort of Sharia law based on the Old Testament. When you hear that what Islam needs is a Protestant Reformation, a Martin Luther, we should remind these people that the Reformation Protestants were the Muslims of the Christian world, opposed to art, opposed to religious hierarchy, opposed to secular learning, and in favor of sola scriptura, puritanical prohibitions, and obliterating idolatrous art. In the 19th and 20th centuries, you find them endorsing the Islamic prohibition on alcohol, taking hatchet to whis has hatchets to whiskey cakes with Carrie Nation and her friends. The Reformation Protestant critique of Catholicism was that it was too free. Catholics were drunks and layabouts and party animals, insisting on celebrating every possible saint's day with <laughs> booze, brawls, and flirtations. The church was full of art and luxury-loving sensualists. They loved books, too. <laughs> they forgave all rather than condemned all. It was merry England when it was merry. Protestant England was Cromwell, the Puritans, and the banning of Christmas. The crypto-Catholic Stuart Restoration was the restoration of Christmas, horse racing, and the theater. <laughs> On which side is freedom, my friends? Celebrating life, the joys of creation, and the nativity? Or banning everything to abolish sin and improve economic productivity? We know which side the state is on. <clears throat> the state does not like the church because the church is a check on state power. The church is the protector of the family against the state. The church is the upholder of the individual against the state. And the state's desire to regulate and control. <clears throat> Reading history and doing so honestly, who can deny that the greatest check on state power throughout the entire history of Europe, from the conversion of Constantine to the 20th century, was the Catholic Church. One of my favorite stories I like to tell people in settings such as this is the story of the Roman Emperor Theodosius. One of his favorite generals was killed at the circus by the mob in Greece. And so he got the mob back in the circus and arranged German troops are in the Roman army to come in and kill all the people in the circus who are responsible. Ambrose, the bishop of Milan, an unarmed cleric, told the emperor of Rome that he must do penance in his church for this crime, executing traditional Roman justice. 
first, the emperor protested, saying, look at David. David killed lots of people. Rulers have to do these things. And Ambrose said, you have emulated David in his sin, now emulate David in his repentance. And so the emperor of Rome, the commander of all Rome's legions, stripped himself of imperial insignia, all military insignia, and did penance before an unarmed cleric. This is something new in the history of the world. I'm a great admirer of the Romans, of the Roman Empire. But this, but this is not something Rome knew before, knew Christ, before Rome knew Christianity, Catholic Christianity. It was the Catholic Church that brought a moral check to bear on the exercise and perquisites of power. Think of the martyrdom of Becket, of Sir Thomas More. Think of the Protestant revolt, which argued that the power of the state was scriptural, and that the power of the papacy, of Christ's church on earth, was not. Think of the Enlightenment, the French Re Re Revolution, the culture comp of Bismarck, and later intellectual and political currents, including fascism, communism, and frankly, the liberalism of our own time, all of which saw or see the state as the essential thing. Centralization of state authority as the central task. State direction as the essential instrument of reform. As Daniel Patrick Moynihan said, it's the job of liberals to get the culture right through politics. And what was and is the roadblock before these reformers? The Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, which has ever asserted the freedom and necessity of subsidiary institutions, of institutions independent from the state, is the church which has ever asserted the rights of the family against the state. It is the church which has ever protested, in the words of Pope Pius XI, against the pagan worship of the state, by which he meant, in particular, fascism. And who today stands for the freedom of every unborn child to the right to life? Who stands today for the absolute integrity of every individual life against genetic or other engineering of the human person? What institution in the United States today is the greatest non-government provider, that is, non-coercive provider, of education, medical care, and aid to the poor. And even here, the freedom for which the church stands under threat by interest groups and bureaucrats who would compel the church to turn its hospitals into abortuaries, to force its insurance providers to cover the cost of artificial contraception that the church considers sinful, and even potentially to dictate what is taught in church schools. And of course, there are more insidious ways to penetrate and secularize the church from within. An institution like the church is always an attractive target for agent provocateurs. A certain revolutionary type, identified by Soren Kierkegaard, now, this is a quote, leaves everything standing, but cunningly empties it of significance. Today, one is less likely to find a French revolutionary shooting priests, abolishing the Church of Christ, and replacing it with the Church of Reason, throwing out the Gregorian calendar, and starting again with the year zero, though you will find variations on all these themes, yet just as dangerous, if not more so, you will find men and women in Catholic institutions, and even in priestly and religious vocations, who are at one with the secular world, and who are content to leave everything standing, but to cunningly <coughs> empty it of significance. They do so in the name of progress, which is supposed to be the name of freedom, but which is more often freedom's enemy. When our forefathers looked to define their political freedom, they did so in terms of the inherited, the natural rights of Englishmen. When men in England 
defined their rights, they did so in terms of the common law, grounded in the Magna Carta, which itself had been shepherded by the Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, and in rights that stretched back into the mists of Saxon England. Freedom in the truth is the natural right of man. We will find freedom and we can defend freedom if we pursue the truth. When modern men adopt the cynicism of jesting Pilate, what is truth? We can tell them. We have not washed our hands of the responsibility of searching for it. We have found the truth through reason, revelation, which is just another word for history, and most important in our free will acceptance of the truth through the gift of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of Catholic freedom will always be vibrant because it is a key to the faith. The true Catholic is a Tory anarchist, someone who believes in loyalty to persons and institutions, fidelity to the faith, and otherwise letting the good times roll. <laughs> and that joy in life is very important. We should never give way to despair at the state of the world. As I began quoting Auburn Waugh, so let me end by quoting perhaps his most immortal words. They are these. There are countless horrible things happening all over the country and horrible people prospering, but we must never allow them to disturb our equanimity or deflect us from our sacred duty to sabotage and annoy them whenever possible. <laughs>